Welcome, welcome to the ISAT Senior Symposium. We have Brenna Cordova and Matt and Madeline Dan Hires and their and their topic is stream bank stream bank restoration in the JMU farm structure and stability. Hi, I'm Brianna and I'm Madeline and I'm just going to tell you more information about who we are and why we were interested in this project. Uh, I myself am an environment concentration with an ISAT and Madeline's actually a dual concentration in energy and environment. And uh, we, uh, throughout our ISAC career, got interested in uh, topics dealing with environmental sustainability, especially um, soil, water, and air quality, and we love being outdoors. Um, so given our common interest and our desire to work outdoors, when Dr. Nash presented us with the opportunity to work on the compromised stream bank at the James Madison University Farm, um, we jumped at the opportunity to do this. So um, before I can start to talk about the compromised stream bank at the James Madison University Farm, it's important that you understand what a healthy stream bank looks like. Um, so here I've uh, displayed an illustration by Jeffrey Mathis. Mathis. It's pretty much the simplest image I could find, which uh, shows that a bank slope should just be um, gradual. Um, three to one slope, we'll explain that later. And we should see, um, laser pointer. Well, you can see some grasses um, moving up to shrubs and then as we get into larger bushes and the larger trees back here um, and their root systems will really hold in the soil um, that could be eroded when the river um, flooding occurs and all that. But we'll go into more of that later. So here's at the James Madison University farm um, at the North River. In the first image you can kind of see an overview looking at the bank. Um, here's two images which kind of show the slope of the bank. Um, it's really steep out there and um, we, we've uh, seen that the vegetation is actually now um, falling almost into the stream bank rather than staying up on the bank. So we don't really have a healthy stream bank out there. Um, so the scope of our project, we first wanted to assess the bank matrix. So the matrix being um, the soils, uh, the order and composition the order and structure of the soils and other living materials within the bank. Then we want to determine these erosion prone areas, um, which are likely to erode of the bank, and evaluate alternative solutions and determine best management practices to maintain the structure and stability of the bank. So purpose of our project, determine effective methods to stabilize and maintain the structure of the bank. Um, we then want to reduce sedimentation from the property and then pose as a model for stream bank restoration in the James Madison, or in the North River Basin. So now that you know more about the problem and our scope and where we intend to go with our project, I'm going to talk to you about the Jamie Farm, its history, and its location. So originally, the property was owned by the Hook family. They built a, house, a farmhouse in 1840, which you can see in this picture, um, in which they lived and farmed throughout generations. Intense farming practices show significant soil degradation, resulting in poor so soil quality around the farm. Um, James Madison University bought 30 acres of this property and um, it, it was intended for academic and recreational purposes. Um, since then, it's hardly seen um, maintenance or usage with students and faculty. And to be honest, I didn't really know about the farm. Um, it's not really well known around campus. or They're really just trying to uh, revamp it now and actually current construction is happening to um, restore the house as well as um, create a new amphitheater get students out there. More about the location, so it's about 20 minutes from James Madison University um, off Port Republic Road, and this goes to show uh, the area. There's about 25 acres of forest and five acres of managed lawn, um, and about a thousand um, river frontage along North River. We are focusing um, for our area of study on the 400 foot uh, river frontage. Okay. Um, so some of the history of the problems, uh, we're going to target 60 plus years of the loss of a riparian buffer, as well as um, talk about the vulnerable stream bank soils occurring in this area, and um, talk about some historic floods and how that um, has really decreased, uh, or sorry, increased the erosion throughout the bank. Continue. And then in the background you can see an image um, at the JMU farm of a flood that occurred at the James Madison University farm. This is a site we're interested in. Um, it really gets uh, really high up and it's really bad out there. So what exactly is a riparian buffer? The NRCS defines it as a corridor of trees and or shrubs adjacent to streams, lakes, wetlands, or a water body. And as you can see in this picture, it, you can see the strip of vegetation. Uh, the recommended healthy buffer width 
is about 35 to 100 feet. Um, but we do realize that with smaller scale projects such as the JME farm, um, sometimes the 10 to 30 feet would be optimal for healthy conditions. And um, I just want to point out some predominant functions of a riparian buffer. It prevents future erosion, absorbs pollutants, and increases land area. Now Madeline's going to take you through an aerial image analysis. Um, so here we first start off with the image from 1937 um, where you can see the riparian buffer, the width of it is, it's, um, I can't really estimate from the image, but you can see there's a healthy functioning riparian buffer. Um, in this image, you can kind of see the loss of the trees in the forested area, which are maintaining the structure of the bank. Um, and this occurred due to a flood that happened in 1949. Um, in the next picture, we can really see further loss of that riparian buffer. Um, and then in the last image in 2012, um, you can see this. And now I'm going to bring you actually to present day. Um, so this was taken in 2015. It's the most recent photo we have of the um, farm. And you can see that that buffer um, has really, it's really just non-existent at this point. Okay, so moving on to the next problem area, which was we looked at flood data. Um, here we analyzed flooding to better understand the interactions of the river within the stream bank. The riverbed is actually cut down to bedrock, which um, when heavy water flows um, flow down the stream, it actually has nowhere to go but kind of outwards and even over the bank. Um, causing sedimentation and erosion to occur. Um, so as you can see, we took our data from USGS Water Watch site, and here you indicate the stream gauge closest to your area of study, and that was uh, the stream gauge North River near Burktown, Virginia. Um, it's associated with a number, and it's about 8.4 <coughs> river miles from the James Madison farm. Um, so here it kind of um, portrays the four major historic floods um, of 1942, 1949, 1985, and 1996. Um, we also were interested in seeing the flood data since 2013 of the previous capstone who worked out on the stream bank, um, Taylor Campitel and Kyle Netty, which will further um, bring them up again as we compare our data with theirs. Um, and you can just, it just goes to see that uh, flooding almost occurred in June 4th of 2016. So after assessing flood data and seeing the loss of the riparian buffer, we wanted to analyze stream bank structure and stability. We did this through studying soil texture and composition by performing a bank erosion hazard index and doing a change detection using images. Um, so we used a Munsell soil color chart to identify the layers of the soil and we used a sieve analysis test to um, take the particle size distribution and come up with the composition. Bulk density and moisture, we were interested in finding more about to um, really see how plants can uh, survive under conditions on the stream bank. So furthermore, this is our soil profile. And as you can see, the top layer we have identified as silt. The next layer is sandy clay. And then moving on down, silty clay. And clay is near the water level. Um, more specifically, the sand percentage is important because as um, erosion occurs, um, you're left with the coarser material, material at the top due to the silt and clay being washed away. So you can see a higher percentage at the top versus going all the way down. It's more clay based down. Um, and bulk density restricts growth at a threshold of 1.6 or higher. And our values were pretty average. We have some above, but um, I just want to make a comment on the top layer. That could have been due to an error of sampling. Um, when you take a sample, you have to be perpendicular to the stream bank. And since it kind of is concave throughout, it's hard to get it right um, 90 degrees. So I just wanted to point that out. And then our moisture values were pretty average. And it can sustain plant growth. Um, so next, now that we have understood um, the bank matrix, we wanted to quantify the soil erosion that is occurring at the bank, and we did this by using David Rosgen's Bank Erosion Hazard Index. Um, this is a test which um, has five components, uh, the first being ratio of bank height to bank full height. Uh, if you look at this picture, this would be the bank height, um, and bank full height is um, the height of the bank at which any more water would cause flooding. Um, so the next parameter was the slope, the bank angle, you can see that in this image as well. 
Um, root depth ratio, you can just see the how far down the plant roots go into the bank, looking at, um, at, looking at it as a percentage of the entire bank height. Um, then we go into root density, and we look at um, the portion of roots that are uh, protecting the stream bank and holding in that soil. And on top of, um, and then we have surface coverage, which not only includes the root density, but it also includes the portion of the stream bank that's covered by rocks and plants and other things that will support the structure of the bank. Um, so we like so we had the we chose the modified version of this test due to um, comparison with the 2013 data we received from a previous capstone group, um, and using their methodology, we decided to measure the length of the bank and flag it at every 20. We measured the length of the four, 400 foot of the bank, which was our area of study, uh, which is the maintained lawn, which has, doesn't have as much forested protection. Um, so then, once we had our 400 feet of river frontage. We marked the 20-foot intervals along the entirety of that 400-foot, so zero to, zero to 400. Um, and then at each of those 20-foot marks, we recorded the bank height and slope. Um, next, we could look across the entire zero to 20-foot interval or so on um, to estimate root density and surface protection as a percentage across that 20-foot interval. Then we estimated the root depth across those 20-foot intervals and divided that by bank height to give us um, the percentage so down here you can see a score chart which we got from the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. Um, this is their standard operating procedure that they use and we found that these values are um, pretty consistent with our previous data that we received. So here we see our root depth values and root density surface protection. Um, all of the values that we have the, a range and then we have a score which we would assign to that range. Um, once you have a score for each parameter, we can add those up and to give you a total score by category, which assesses the likelihood of the bank to erode. So we can determine whether that portion of the bank is either very low, um, meaning that it's very unlikely to erode, or if it's extreme risk, um, meaning that it's extremely likely to erode. Um, so moving on, here's our raw data um, and, the, and the corresponding scores. So you can see our bank height and root depth values, um, root density, surface protection, bank angle, um, all at their recorded um, distance from the west end of the bank. And um, then you can look at the corresponding scores that we assigned to each of these values. Once we had corresponding scores um, for each parameter, then we could add it up to give us a total score at the end, and we could determine how likely the bank was to erode at each of these locations. Um, as you can see, our results have shown that all of our areas are either moderate to very high, meaning that we have a big problem out of the stream bank on, at the James Madison University farm. Um, so more of a visual representation, um, here's just the data graphs. And um, the areas in red are the areas that we determined that are most vulnerable and most likely to erode. Um, and so, like, as you can see, like I said before, none of our values were low or very low, and we didn't see anything extreme, but we can only predict that it's going to get worse. Um, so here are some of the areas that I highlighted in the, by the red bars right here. Um, so first, I mean, I'm going to explain to you what, uh, what have caused the high BHI scores of these areas. So right here, you can kind of see that this tree, um, although there is a, an extensive root system that is holding all of this soil in place, um, the weight of the trunk is now causing stress to the bank. And if we don't do something about that, this tree, um, you can see how the river is kind of cutting behind the tree. and we can only um, assume that more of the soil is likely is going to be eroding. Uh, you can see some more of the exposed root system of this tree. Um, before, it would have been on top of the bank, providing a lot of support for all of the soil. But now, um, you can kind of see they're falling into the river. Um, this is our biggest issue that we've determined at the James Madison University from is these trees. Um, next, here's another image where we saw high scores. We kind of have the opposite problem. We don't have any extensive root systems. We only have small grasses and shrubs. Um, which are usually good if the bank is sloped at the proper angle. However, this bank is undercut, and you can, if you were to kind of get in there like, in waders like we did, you'd be able to tell that the land is kind of bulging out, um, so the water is kind of coming under. There's nothing supporting that land mass, which eventually we can expect it to fall. Um, so just a little bit more of that. You can kind of see another area of the bank uh, where we have the exposed root systems, um, the weight of the trees. These ones are doing a little better, but we can only ex expect them to keep falling down. Um, right here we have another problem with the undercut bank as well. Um, so now that I've uh, explained to you how we've quantified our uh, bank erosion index and I've showed you some images of what a, uh, an, a, what a compromised bank looks like, we can begin to determine or begin to quantify so the rate of soil erosion over time, which we did through a comparative study. 
So the BHI comparison was between a previous capstone, as we, as we have mentioned previously, uh, with Campitel and Kyle Netty. And with our values, um, we went ahead and graphed it. Ours is shown in the green, and their values are shown in brown. And it just goes to show that overall BH, BEHI scores have increased over time. Um, you can also see that um, there's some discrepancies in between the ends of um, our data, and this could be due to differences in methodology. But I just want to point out the East has the largest uh, discrepancy, and we believe, with in addition to differences in methodology, that could also be due to um, that area. That specific area is in more of a forested area, so there's less human activity and animal activity, kind of. Um, getting away at the, or that would eat away at the extreme bank. So um, that's the reasoning for that. And right here, um, the red arrows go to show our target areas and problem areas that Madeline just described to you. Um, and we're going to go ahead and show you images as we did with the uh, our values of BHI and compare them between uh, four years ago. So as you can see um, in today, today, um, the nearby, this is the cattle farmer neighbor um, next to our property. And um, you can kind of see the bank cuts back a lot more compared to 2013 um, to the point where if that tree were to eventually fall in, the corner is more likely um, to be taken out. So this is one of our most extreme problem areas. Um, as well as you can kind of see a fence in 2013 <laughs> that had to be removed because the bank uh, has been completely degraded. And it's actually, you can really no, see it in that picture? Yeah, the fence is, the right. fence is uh, right up there because it's lost so much of its height. Um, continuing on, we're gonna compare it to a 2001 capstone project that uh, Dr. Benzing advised. Um, and it just goes to show that over 15 years, um, this corner has really seen some changes. And um, this, um, root structure isn't even there that's been washed away and the, the fence goes to show that significant changes have occurred. So moving forward, our other big problem area was pretty much the whole middle section of uh, our area of study of the 400 uh, feet. And um, you can see over time um, with the tire that the bank seems to be um, back more, which means that um, then again, more soil was lost over time. So we actually know that that tire is pretty stuck in there. It doesn't really move because we've tried moving it and getting it out. Um, as well as another indicator was when we were waiting around in there, um, your feet get stuck in all the silt that has come up or that has washed off and you literally have to yank your foot out. So yeah, I actually saw in twice. Yeah, <laughs> <around there. laughs> uh, yeah. Kind of got soaked. So yeah, it's a, uh, mostly silt that's on the bottom and that just suggests that um, all of it's falling from the top and yeah, just shows. Um, and then comparing that to 2001, you can see uh, it's completely kind of changed, which you can see um, better in the next picture. Um, the shrubbery is actually not completely there. There's actually more uh, lowland vegetation. Um, and the appearance of the tire happens in 2013, that's new. Um, <laughs> And then more and more uh, road exposure. Um, you can see it better in two slides before, but um, roads are being exposed at a greater rate as well. So. All right, so this is a brief summary of our results. So we determined that the silty midsection of the bank is the most, most vulnerable. Um, there have been no USGS defined flooding events in the past four years. However, there has been significant erosion, um, or in most areas, erosion has increased. And we've determined that through our BHI comparison. Um, we've also determined that the existing, tree, ex existing trees along the bank are severely undercut um, and that we are way past the tipping point out there. Um, we, we need to get some heavy machinery out there to really take care of this problem. Um, and bank stability is projected to further, inc or further decline if no action is taken. And we're going to continue to see a loss of property, which also um, loses some of the value of the property. And it's a really beautiful area out there. We want to preserve it. Um, we don't want any of this to continue to happen. So then we, after me and Brianna kind of did, uh, summarized all of our results and came together and consolidated, 
We had a charrette on February 15th where we met with our other capstone groups. Um, one of them is sitting right here. Uh, Sean, Grant, and Josh, they worked on um, 3D modeling and best management practices for stream make restoration. I'm um, in a landscape design and view shed that was Marissa and Brielle. They presented earlier today and um, they were just focusing on which kind of native species to plant along the bank, but they can, while still project, project while still protecting the view from the house. Um, and as we came together, we, Molly kind of documented our, our progress, took these pictures of us, and she wants to create a new website for the James Madison University, web, um, she wants to create a new webpage for the James Madison University farm because the, old, the current one is very outdated and it's not upkept. Um, so, and once we all came together, we had very different methodologies in determining which areas of the bank were most um, prone to erosion, and uh, we had different suggestions as well as how to fix it. But we determined that the same areas were seeing these issues, which shows that we had different methodologies but the same conclusions. So some conclusions that we all agreed on were the fact that there's undercut trees, there's a concave stream bank, and there's a lack of vegetation out there. So um, our suggestions for undercut trees would be to either remove them or save them by doing some um, support techniques such as revetments, live stakes, or implementing root wads. Um, furthermore, the concave stream bank, um, we would suggest grading it to a three to one slope so that um, for every three feet, there's one foot vertical of length and it's cut at a proper healthy angle. Um, and the last thing we agreed on was the lack of vegetation. So like um, Brielle and Marissa have identified already today, um, they wanted to implement certain species of uh, trees and shrubs to help um, restore that riparian buffer and um, make the view shed and the scenery pretty out there. So um, after we kind of uh, came together with our conclusions and suggestions, we wanted to do something with this. We wanted to make a change on the, at the Jamie Farm. So we had a meeting, which actually occurred this past Tuesday. Um, it was April 18th. Um, we didn't think we were going to get a hold of these people, but we did last minute, just in time for our presentation. Um, we met at the office of the provost. They're in charge with um, budgeting and um, university affairs. And then we also have met with uh, facilities management. They're more in charge of the day-to-day -day and um, project-based work. And um, so the people we met were Gary Shears, Anna Huddick, and Abe Kaufman. Um, you can see them in the picture. Um, also from the provost, we met uh, Jason McCain, McLean and John Holvey. And we each shared our discoveries and suggestions with them. Um, and they actually showed a lot of interest in our work and we were able to discuss the future of the stream bank with them while we were there. Also while we were there this day, we got to see some of the new renovations which were occurring um, on the hook house right here. Um, it was previously, it could not be entered uh, due to the, the stability of the structure. So now they're renovating it, um, making it accessible. Um, we have a pavilion out there and they're building a new amphitheater in there with a trail that would lead up to the stream. Um, and just seeing all this progress out there, if they're putting all this money into um, making this a usable place, we think that we should at least have, um, if it, since it is a university, we want the work out there, our work to be shown, and uh, um, pr promote, the, promote a healthy stream bank. So we got some really positive feedback from this meeting that we're actually really excited about. Um, um, this was kind of like our breakthrough moment after two years of gathering data and working alongside our team members. Um, we're able to kind of see that progress will eventually be made on the stream bank. Um, in regards to future progress, we think that they'll first start with fixing the bank slope by grading it with heavy machinery back to that three to one healthy bank angle. As well as next, they'll have to decide on whether to remove the trees or support them with, um, for example, the techniques I mentioned, such as live stakes. Um, but the, another big takeaway for our project was that we wanted to um, show as like a comparison for future capstones as we did with 2013 data um, to be shown and documented and uh, able to compare again in the future. And so through the creation of the updated JMU farm website that Molly Bohan um, made for us, we're going to continue to uh, have a model of stream bank restoration be able to document it through time, as well as communicate it with the public. Um, continuing on, uh, we just want to thank our advisor, Professor Nash, for her unconditional support and assistance um, in helping us with our project, as well as her persistence towards it and getting things changed. Um, and we want to do a shout out to Kyle Snow for helping us gather our equipment, 
we couldn't have done that without you, uh, as well as your advice on um, the soil science and the methodologies. Um, as well as thank the JMU Office of the Provost and JMU Facilities Management for meeting with us this past week and really getting interested in our project and hopefully we get some uh, progress made out there. As well as ISAT Department for this opportunity to partake in this challenging and rewarding experience and our team members for uh, the constant collaborative 